Patrick Denise, who did a wonderful job today with her and, um, We have so many talented people here in our church that, uh, you know, sometimes you guys don't even know how good you really are until you do it. And so, Denise, you're a natural. I encourage you to continue to say yes and amen. And I believe that the Lord is going to continue to use you to be a blessing. How many can say amen to that? We are going to continue in our time of worship today. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Malachi chapter 1, verse 8. Malachi chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, next to you on the tables, you'll see some uh, offering cards, some tithing cards. I would encourage you to fill it out with your address and any information that's uh, permanent to you. We want to make sure that we uh, do this correctly so that that way at the end of the year for tax purposes, you can have your information in correctly. We also have the ability to do text to give, which I'll share that number in a few minutes. Actually, the number is 813-324-6111. And you can also do online giving at mynewlife.org. Be sure that when you do your online giving that you go down to the Wesley Chapel campus, to the Wesley Chapel campus. For those that you don't know, you are in Wesley Chapel. <laughs> Go down to the Western chapter canvas and give online. Amen. Malachi chapter 1, verse 8. Look what it says. And this is, uh, we read in the New International Version. It says, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? How many of you know that God is our greatest authority? Somebody say amen. amen. If we wouldn't give our earthly authorities our scraps or our leftovers, would we? If the governor of Florida was coming to your home, would you just throw something together five minutes before? Or would you prepare? Yet so often we offer God the leftover portions of our time, of our money, of our energy, our thoughts, and our emotions. He ends up getting our scraps and rejects, just as the Israelites were offering the worst animals in sacrifice. Can you imagine for a moment the burden that it takes to care for a lame animal? The temptation to sacrifice such an animal would be very real and very easy. And the truth is that you and I face a very similar temptation. We pray with the extra five minutes we have. And we're not even sure what to do with those extra five minutes, so let's just take some time to pray. We help and we volunteer in church when you get the credit for it. When pastor sees me, I'll be on time. Or it's quite possible that the only time you give up your time is when you have some extra time off. We're extremely happy to tithe and to give offering as long as we still have some disposable income. We read our faith books. If we have time in between novels, romantic novels, Harry Potter and all of that other stuff. But we have to be honest with ourselves. Extras are not really a sacrifice. When we willingly sacrifice time, money, and energy, that is what has value to you. And it settles the greater value of God in our hearts and in our minds. You and I have the ultimate example through the Word of God. We have that example in God Himself that He sacrificed His Son for you. We have that example through Jesus who sacrificed His life for you. Wouldn't you agree with me in saying that He is worthy of our best too? Can I get a better yes than that? The question today is, are you giving your best to God? It's not a difficult thing to answer, but it's a difficult thing to live. So I'm going to invite you today to give your best to God. Give your best to God. 
Give your best tithe, give your best offering, give your best praise, and give your best worship. Could you stand with me as we do our offering pledge together? I want you to repeat after me. Now, say it with me on the count of three. One, two, and three. We understand and agree that tithing is an act of obedience, an attitude of the heart, an expectation of the harvest, a reflection of our creator, and an opportunity for God's grace. We covenant with God and each other to faithfully give 100% of our tithes. Wait, wait, wait one second. I want to start testing people to see if they remember the offering pledge. I'm going to tell you why. It's just a month ago was my daughter's birthday. And she got some money from different kid, different you know, family members. And she goes, and, and it's the first thing she did is, Dad, I need an envelope from church. Because I got to give my tithe. This is not something we say in church. This is what we live out in our lives. Amen. Close your eyes with me. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your blessings over our life. I pray, God, that you would multiply whatever is given today, Lord God. And I pray, God, that if there's anything holding back the blessing from our people, God, that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that they would not be able to contain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Play. You can download a lot of the songs that we do here on Sundays 
just look up free worship and you'll be able to see at least 40 to 50 songs of songs that have been recorded, some amazing dynamic songs. I want to encourage you uh, to support what God is doing in New Life Covenant Church. Amen? Amen. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Chapter 1. Did I say 11? I meant 1. Hebrews 11, one of the, uh, my favorite verses. So we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, verse 1. If you have it, you just shout amen. Amen. This is what it says in the New International Version. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through prophets at many times and in various ways. God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. I'm going to ask if you can just to hold your Bible close to your heart. But take a moment and look up here as we do the introduction to our sermon series. I want you to repeat after me. Your word, your word is written in my mind. Your word, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. I will seek you, will seek you with, all my strength. with all my strength. I choose, I choose to, live to live my life according to your word. To your, word. Your, word your word, O Lord, o Lord is, eternal. is eternal. Amen. 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 Can we give it up for me? I want you to high five. Two people say it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. And then you may be seated. How many enjoyed May doing her sign language today? Yeah. Come on. Today's something for the week is called sign language. Sign language. And I want to make sure that we as, um, as a church, we want to encourage our people. We have so many gifted and talented yes. people here in the room. Amen. So we want to encourage you. Uh, those that don't know, May is an amazing dancer as well. And we look forward to having her participate in different times with us as well. Can somebody just give it up for me? We're in our sermon series called Whisper. How many know that God speaks through their different forms and fashions? Amen. How many have, have, have heard when God speaks through fire? God speaks through different forms and measures in our life. But I want to talk to you about August 10th, 1874. How many of you were alive for that time? <laughs> a 27-year-old, Alexander Graham Bell, he sat on a blanket near a bluff overlooking the Grand River in Ont Ontario, Canada. He tinkered all morning with a phonographic, I have no idea what that means, but it's an apparatus that mimicked the action of the human ear. His passion was deaf education, and he wondered whether electric currents could be made to simulate sound waves and transmit voice electrically. Famously, Bell wrote a letter to his father saying, the day is coming when telegraph wires will be laid on the houses just like water or gas and friends can converse with each other without leaving their homes. It was a brave vision for a brave new world. And on March 10th, 1876, Bell and his assistant were up late trying to perfect the clarity of their sound transmission. His assistant was named Watson, and suddenly Watson heard the words that changed so much with clarity he heard, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. After being presented at the World Fair in June of that year, the New York Herald called it almost supernatural. And over our lifetime, over my lifetime, communication has drastically changed. I remember Phones that didn't have num well, they did have numbers on it, but you had to turn the knob. How many remember that? Yes. Right? And I remember that 
It was a square phone. It was pretty big, and you had to take your time. Imagine trying to make a quick phone call. <laughs> I also remember that if I wanted to come call my girlfriend because my parents didn't want me to run up the bill, I would have to take about four or five quarters and run to the corner to a pay phone. How many, how many know what I'm talking about? I'm not the only one that's my age in this room. Right? Some of our kids don't know what we're talking about right now. But I remember going to a pay phone to have to put a quarter in. And there was these pay phones in New York City that was like a booth and you would sit in there and you would have some privacy because you just close it behind you. Right? How many remember this? And then I remember when I got a little cooler and a little bit older, high school, I got a beeper. <laughs> How many remember beepers? And if you wanted somebody to call you quickly, you would put a code 911. <laughs> How many remember that? So, so we all remember some of these changes, and then came the next tell. How many remember the next tell phones? It was like a walkie talkie. Where you at? Remember? Then came, I remember the first time I think my wife sent me a text message. I was like, how do I respond to this? So I, every time she would text message me, I would call her back because I didn't know how to respond to it. So I would just, I'm doing good. Until I learned what a text message was. And then you got all, you know, emails and, uh, Social media has changed our communication. Things have changed regarding our communication. And I wonder, and I began to think about this as we were preparing for this uh, sermon series, I wonder how much attention we keep in communicating with God and being communicated to by God. Truth be told, no message is more important than the message that God speaks. Yeah. And God speaks through impressive measures or through a gentle whisper. And I believe that now in the year 2018, God is still in the business of communication. How many believe that? Amen. If you go with me to uh, Mark chapter 7, read a small portion of this narrative, and it says that Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. Can you just repeat that for me? No, I'm just messing with you. There are some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. And after he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to the heaven and with a deep sigh said, Emphatha, which means be opened. At this time, the man's ears were open, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them, do not tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. The people were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speaks. Speak. Jesus' miracle, the miracle on this day, it introduces us to the power of Jesus, that Jesus has the power over sickness. Can someone say amen? amen? And I believe that Jesus has the power over our disabilities. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. But my question is, why would Jesus ask the people not to talk about it? Think about that for a second. I mean, that perturbed me because anytime God does something good, I want to tell the world about what Jesus is. Why would Jesus tell them, please don't say nothing to anyone? Write this down. We must not be so concerned about what Jesus can do for us that we forget to listen to his message. And Jesus was constantly speaking about the kingdom of God that was going to come. And people were so caught up with the miracle that they forgot about the message. So don't get caught up in what Jesus can do for you. Get caught up in listening to what he has to say to you. Because I believe that God is still in the business of speaking to his children. 
How many of you have heard God's voice? I want you to know that God's ability to speak in strange and mysterious ways is nothing short of astounding. The Bible says that he spoke to Moses in a burning bush. Could you imagine that? Walking up to a bush and the bush would be burning and now it's speaking to you? Well, that's the business that God is. He spoke to Pharaoh through ten signs and wonders. He spoke to Hezekiah via an illness. And he spoke to Babylonian astrologers through the stars. He spoke to Balaam through a donkey. Can you imagine for a second walking into the petting zoo of Hope Fest? Seriously, and all of a sudden, Taina. Seriously, can you imagine that you're, you're walking through this petting zoo of Hope Fest and all of a sudden the horse just looks at you and says, Michelle, straight up. But that's how God, God speaks Amen. through different signs. Amen. God will speak through you through a stone, through a rock. God will speak to you through a movie. He'll speak to you through a, through a song. And God will speak to you, to you through a message on a Sunday morning. Can somebody say amen? amen? And the writer of Hebrews identifies that God speaks through many different ways. But then he zeroes in on God's greatest revelation Jesus Christ. He is the full and final revelation of God. He is the Son of Man, but He is also the Son of God. He is the creator of all things and the heir of all things. He is the way, the truth, the life, and His yeah. name. Well, at His name, every knee shall bow yes. and every tongue shall confess yes. that He is you, the Lord. Yes. The question is, does God still speak in a variety of ways? And I believe that God still speaks in a variety of ways. Now you have to understand that I've experienced some crazy things in my life. I remember being 15 years old and taking a bus, a public city bus in New York City, the Q24. And I was on my way to church with my bus pass. And I get on the bus, because my parents were bad, they would leave me. I was late, I had to get to church. And I'm again on the bus, and at that time, everybody had tokens. This is even before Metro, the passes, Metro cards. And I remember I sat in the back of the bus, and all of a sudden, a lady, and she was wearing, a, 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 it was like an African gear that she was wearing. She comes and she sits right in front of me, and she is staring at me. I'm just looking at her like, she better not say that to me, right? <laughs> And she says, excuse me. I looked at her and I said, yeah, how can I help you? You're a pastor. I'm not a pastor, my father's a pastor. No, no, no. I know you think you're a musician, <laughs> wow. but that's just a part of what God called you to. I'm looking at this lady like she was crazy. I've seen what my father had gone through as a pastor. I've seen what my parents had to sacrifice me pastors. I've seen it in my family members. The last thing I wanted to do was become a pastor. And at 15 years old, a lady who's never met me, and I've never seen her afterwards, told me, you're called to pastor. I still remember that to this day. And I've gone to situations where, where I've gone to places I've gone to, to, to where nobody would see me, nobody would dare to say that they know me from somewhere, and they would be like, you're a pastor. There's an anointing over your life. I remember one time I went to a counselor, a Christian counselor. It's okay to get counseling people. Amen. Come on, seriously. Because I know that that was taboo back in the days. No, it's okay. Amen. And I went to a counselor, and all of a sudden the counselor, we're talking back and forth, and we're like throwing up on the table. Like, we're just going all in. Like everything that I've ever done wrong, I shared with him. And also he says to me, I gotta stop for a second. I feel the anointing of God in this room. I know why the enemy has come after you because of the calling in your life. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that God still speaks. Yes, come on. The question is, are you listening? Yes, come on. God will speak to you any way he can take uh, get your attention, God will speak to you. You know what I hope you guys don't do? 
I hope you don't wait to get to a really tough situation yes. and for God to really put you in a bad situation to speak to you because then he got your attention. Yep. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just speaking today. I, I'm preaching. <laughs> God still speaks in a variety of ways. And to think, this is good, write this down. To think that God only speaks in the Bible is to handcuff the God of the Bible. I will. To think that God only speaks in the Bible is to handcuff the God of the Bible. However, the scripture is before us to provide checks and balances. Why? Because God will never say anything that will contradict his word. Uh, Y'all better say amen a little bit louder than that. Amen. So don't follow no false teaching. Hey, you know, I, uh, Harold and I were laughing about this. The, the pastor said that he was giving people pencils. Before they, when everybody, everybody they walked into church, he would give them a pencil. He goes, you want to know why? Because everybody thinks that they're spirit led. Oh Shut up. We got people preaching spirit-led things that have no biblical foundation. So understand what I'm saying, that God will always speak through different forms and fashions, but it will never contradict the word of God. Yeah. And so you got to make sure that you understand this word so that you don't just fall for every little uh, charismatic leader out there. Somebody say amen. amen. Helen Keller, how many know who Helen Keller is? Amen. She lost her vision after a bout with meningitis. Check this out. She was blind, deaf, and mute because of this. Keller said that the loss of hearing was her greatest incapacity. She once famously said, the only thing worse than blindness is having sight but no vision. Perhaps the same can be said of those who have hearing but don't really listen. She could have given up on life, totally isolated from the outside world. Instead, she learned to listen in a different way. She learned to listen to music by literally laying her hands on the radio and to feel the movements of the speaker. She learned to listen by touching someone's lips and their face. We don't just listen with our ears. We listen with our eyes and we listen with our hearts. And this is how we discern promptings people in pain. We don't just read scripture, we read desires, doors, and dreams. And God speaks via body language. His body is the church. The language of people. He speaks through different tones of voices. The languages of desire, the language of pain, but the church must seek the presence of God for discernment. It takes discernment to spot a door that is closing. It's, it takes discernment to open or to see open doors. It takes discernment to recognize God-given dreams and your own personal desires. It takes discernment to see why the pain you have leads you to a greater perspective. And it takes discernment to read people. My wife, we often sit and have conversations and we cast vision for the future of our lives. And sometimes she, 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 you know, we, we'll, we'll talk about a person or we'll talk about something, a situation. And she read it one way and I read it another way. And you know how I finish the conversation? Because you want to be right. How many of you want to be right? <laughs> Just keep it real. I said, wait and see. A month later, she'd be like, how did you know? Discernment, baby. It takes discernment. And some of you guys live life by face value. And you just run with every wind. Every, every wind, you're gone with the wind. It takes discernment in this life that we live. It takes discernment to make wise choices and dumb choices. How many of you 
are living a life of discernment. You don't have to say amen at one time. <laughs> the person, look what it says, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are what? Discerned only through the spirit. Oh, somebody ought to say amen to that. Amen. Check this out. The English word discern comes from the Greek word epignosis, which means knowledge gained by first-hand contact. In other words, it is experiential. Y'all didn't catch that. Some of y'all just went right over your head. You can't get discernment until you put in a position to, grant or to gain discernment. In other words, the more you open the door for people to hurt you, you'll understand when they're going to hurt you the next time. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. That's hard. Who wants to be hurt here? Nobody. And that's how many of us we put a wall up. But you'll never gain discernment until you put yourself in a position to be spirit-led in your walk. I remember when I was, uh, when I was starting to preach, about 20 years old, and I would be preaching and God would put visions in my eyes while I was preaching. And I would see things and I didn't, and I didn't know what to do. So I went and I would, I would go to my mom. Like any preacher's kid would do, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Say, mom. And she would say, listen, if it's to edify the body, just do it. And let the cards fall where they may. I was scared. So I was invited to go preach in this church in Brooklyn and I'm preaching a message about hope and I'm preaching my heart out and all of a sudden my eyes are closed, I can't see anything and all of a sudden I see the word divorce. And I'm like, what's going on? And I, and I remember what my mom said and I said, somebody in this room is about to get divorced. And God is saying to hold on. I had no clue who I was talking to, what I was saying. I just knew that I saw the word divorce in my eyes. To God be the glory. Amen. Three or four years later, a couple approached me and said, Pastor, do you remember when you came to preach in Brooklyn, New York? You talked about divorce. It was me and him. I said, wow. You cannot gain discernment until you start practicing it in your life. And some of you the reason that you're failing is because you're trying to live this life on a natural level and God is calling, to you, calling you to live on a supernatural level. Some of you have been trying to do things your own way and you keep on falling and, and just, just getting scraped up. Why? Because you're living it on a level that was not meant for you. You have to go through some things. You, hurt, you have to learn from the people who hurt you. You have to learn to be taught by certain things that cause you pain. It's not from Yale University, but it's from the School of Hard Knocks. It's not book smarts, it's street smarts. And the best way to learn a new language is not from a book or sitting in a classroom, it's by full immersion. You have to put yourself in a position where that is all you can hear and all that you can speak. I want you to write this down. You have to jump into the deep end and you have to learn to swim. You have to learn to jump into the deep end with this thing called the Holy Spirit. You have to understand that in order for you to survive, you cannot do this on your own strength. I know that you've done it on your own before, but now you know. And when you know, you're held to a higher standard. Somebody say amen. amen. I want you to know that God still speaks through signs. Signs can be subjective. But if we miss the signs that come our way, we might have missed the miracle. God generally speaks through the divine appointments and divine timing. And I stand on the promises of his word. That God is preparing good works in advance. I stand on his word where it says that God is ordering our footsteps. I stand on his word where it says that he is working all things for our good. And I make no apologies 
for the old school nature of reality that God is still in the business of strategically positioning you to meet the right people at the right time, at the right place, and the place is now. You're here because God wants you to live in this thing. It's not okay to continue to live off testimonies from the past. And it's also not okay to live off of somebody else's glory. God is trying to reveal himself in your life. What are you waiting for? Or better yet, what are you listening to? What are you listening to? We're reading on Wednesdays the book of Acts. And I'm going to paraphrase very quickly. Chapter 1. Jesus, before his ascension, tells the apostles to go back to Jerusalem. Wait there because you need to be empowered for the work before you. I want you to know, people of God, that obedience precedes the blessing. And on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that through this sermon series, that I believe that through this message, that the Lord is preparing you and I for the work that is before us. But we cannot do this if we use tools that are in the natural. We need the supernatural Holy Spirit to fight the giants that you and I face today. Stand with me. Sign language. You and I need divine revelation to read the signs. You and I need divine revelation to read the signs. And what if God has been trying to speak to you and he's been trying to get your attention and maybe you've been too busy to let the Holy Spirit in. I don't want you to delay today. Every eye closed, but if, if you need a touch from the Holy Spirit, if you need a touch from the Holy Spirit, you're not willing to live on the life, on the plane that you're living on now. You're not willing to stay there. You want to go further. You want to go deeper. You want to get to know Him more. And you want to hear His voice. I'm going to give you three minutes to come up to the altar. We're going to pray with you today. We're going to pray with you today for the Holy Spirit to empower you and to equip you to do the work that is before you. We have one person. Anybody else that wants to join her at the altar? We have two people, three. Anyone else? Anyone else? Four. Don't look up to see who it is. Look up because you're walking to the altar. I know that there's more people in the room that need the Holy Spirit to start moving in their lives. I'm going to pause right here because I know that there are more people in this room that need to hear and need to see and read the signs that are before them. Every eye closed and as the worship team begins to sing this song, the altar will remain open for the next four to five minutes. Every eye closed, every eye closed. Holy Spirit, come down.
probably speaking in this house, speaking to God. We need 
the Spirit of God. We need the Spirit of God. At 6 o'clock, the doors will be open at 5.30. I want you to come in here. If you're going to bring a pillow with you, you bring a pillow and you just lay down in front of the presence of God. I don't care. As long as we're together seeking the face of the Father. And I believe, I believe, that we're going to come back next week with a testimony to share that's going to encourage others to also seek the face of God. Somebody say amen. amen. In a posture of receiving, just extend your hands this way. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and may the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and may the Lord grant you peace. God bless you. Go in peace.